Figure it out. Hello, this is Adam Carlick from Figure It Out Productions. The following video is a video of some kind, and I hope you enjoy it. Hey everyone, welcome to the Figure It Out cast. I'm Adam Corlick. This is for March 2019. As always, this is a Patreon podcast, so if you have Patreon, if you support my Patreon, you get this extremely early. You also get my other videos early, usually by a few days. Although, if you don't want to do that and you're listening to the public version, that's awesome too. It comes out near the end of the month. Thank you very much, everybody, for just being a listener. Much appreciated. So, uh, as always, uh, I'm going to go over a whole bunch of subjects here. Uh, there's links in the description with time code to each of these subjects in case you want to skip around or anything like that uh but yeah first and foremost just hope you guys have been having a good month i uh, hope february was awesome for you and moving on into march uh for now for the majority of you uh, the hope march was awesome too but um yeah, so uh, obviously uh, I'm going to talk about some things that happened to me somewhat recently and news stories like that and just kind of give my two cents on a lot of things. That's generally what this podcast kind of is, uh, rather than making entire dedicated videos to each of these subjects, uh, just because I feel like that can really spam your uh, inbox there, and uh, I don't think anybody really likes that. So I want to condense it for those who actually want my thoughts on these things. First and foremost, it's not so much a subject as it is just, you know, just me talking. Um not too long ago, I got to go up to Toronto, uh, Canada, and do a live stream with my buddy Rerez TV, aka Shane Lewis. Um, Scott the Canadian was unfortunately unavailable for that particular stream, but uh, he still we got a little cameo of him from like the next day. We all went out to dinner; it was really good. Um, but yeah, Toronto is always fun. I love going up there. And uh, one thing that kind of surprised us was uh, Shane and I were out just like you know checking out some video games and stores and stuff, just looking at things. And then one of the stores, they you know uh, they asked us like, hey, you know, are you gonna be at the swap tomorrow we're like the what we had no idea so we found out there was this cool video game swap and we ended up going to it the next day and you guys will see it i it was awesome i, I have a couple photos here just to show you guys like a sense of what the space was like uh but we were not expected to be there nobody thought we were going to be uh but we just waltzed in um now i i don't mean to toot my own horn but sometimes when i hang out with shane uh, especially at these types of things like video game stores or swaps or whatever, um, there can definitely be those times where you'll just see certain people be like, I think that's the nerd from YouTube. Or, I think that's the Rerez guy. You know, like you just kind of get people who kind of notice us. And I, and I know that sounds exceedingly arrogant because I don't feel that way. If you watch the stuff and you ever see me, that's cool, man. Like, hey, let's come over and chat. It's awesome for me. Um, but, you know, I, I never expect that to be a thing. Uh, and I know Shane doesn't either. But um, in that case, we, you know, we went uh, and, uh, well, actually, I should, I should go back a little bit further. We went to uh, a store the day before. Now, uh, the way Shane tells this story uh, is better than the way I would tell it because my perspective was very limited. Uh, we went to a store uh, in southern Ontario somewhere. I want to say it was called Game Swap. Um, and I was, like, looking over. I was in the back corner looking at some video games. And the way Shane says it is there was a guy who came in. And he looked at the clerks and he went, is that, is that Adam Korlick? And they just shrugged because they didn't know who the hell it was. And then, you know, he just, he like asked him again, just out loud. And they're like, I don't know. And then he looked to Shane and he said the same thing. And Shane went, yes, that's Adam Korlick, like really loud. So he could get my attention. I turned around like, what? Sorry, what's happening? Uh, and that guy's name was Tibor. Really nice guy. It was awesome to hang out with you at the store, man. Thank you for, uh, thank you for uh, coming up and talking and everything. Being a fan is always much appreciated. Um, but yeah, so we, we talked there for a bit. And that story, I don't know how that happened exactly. Um, we went to this other game swap I'm talking about now. I know it's confusing. The store's name was Game Swap, and then we went to a game swap. I get it. But multiple people at that game swap kept telling me about how I met up with Tibor because they had seen his, he had done some post on Reddit or something that I still haven't seen. Um, so there was a little bit of buzz that, you know, Shane and I were just hanging around and, you know, we might be at the swap. So it was, was kind of weird. So we, then we actually go to this swap. And I go over and I take those three photos that you saw momentarily. Now I'll put them, I'll put them up here again. Um, as I'm taking these photos, uh, this guy just goes, Instagram or Facebook? And I was like, neither, YouTube. And he goes, oh, all right. Like, kind of like, that's cool, whatever. Like, doesn't really care much. And then the second he does that, one of the guys in the corner who's like one of the dudes selling stuff goes, Adam, oh my God, I didn't know you were going to be here. A huge fan of your channel. Can I have a photo with you? Like that whole thing. <laughs> and then the other dude's just like, Oh, all right. So you really are a YouTuber. Okay. Uh, you know what? My son runs this thing. Would you be willing to talk to him? And so it was kind of like that where I would just kind of got talking to different people about different things. Um, it, ultimately the actual swap, I walked around. I only got one thing. Um, this one dude had like this really cool booth. 
Um, cause he was selling stuff you wouldn't see anywhere. A lot of those type of North American swaps, you see a lot of the same content over and over again. This dude had oddities and treasures. It was awesome. Like he had the Canadian version of the Amiga CD 32. He had an Apple Pippin for sale. Uh, he had all sorts of random, like rare Dreamcast, uh, controllers and, uh, memory cards or VMUs and just all sorts of crazy stuff. And I, I spent a lot of time hanging out at that dude's booth and I picked up an Amiga CD 32 game, which was nice. And my buddy, uh, who will get a shout out later in this video. Uh, actually bought a bunch of the Dreamcast VMUs. Uh, and then I would go around and I kept finding all these PlayStation 2 games that my buddy wanted. So it was funny. I, I Most of this swap was just picking up stuff for a friend of mine. Uh, and then I just got one thing. <laughs> but still, it was pretty cool. Always nice to, to talk to people up there. Canadians are super friendly. And uh, just it was an unexpected convention experience. I, wasn't, I would, just wasn't prepared to have. But it was a lot of fun. So uh, thank you again to Shane for his hospitality there. And thank you to, of course, all the Canadians, uh, always hosp hospitable, wonderful people. Um, but yeah, that was that. So on to our first real news story. Uh, Reggie fils -Aimé. The uh, then president of Nintendo of America, as I'm sure a lot of you know, has retired, and we are now entering the Doug Bowser era. Uh, two parts to this, of course. Well, actually, three. First of all, obviously, a lot of you already know about it, but this is just my two cents on the matter. Um, so that's part one. Part two is, let's talk a little bit about Reggie himself. Uh, I think he's going to be missed over Nintendo. You know, he kind of walked into the Nintendo during the, uh, the middle of the GameCube era and was trying to help revitalize it. Ultimately, I don't know how much he really had to do with certain decisions that Nintendo made about where they are competitively, you know, did he, was he part of why they decided to go with the Wii and go off into their own corner? Was he part of the Wii U and like the strangeness there? Or was he part of the Switch? Or, or was he just kind of taking orders the whole time? All I know is that under him, for the most part, we had very quality gaming experiences. How many of those he was responsible for, I don't know. But uh, yeah, I mean, I was not unhappy with Nintendo primarily during his tenure. Um, certain decisions that were made over there were probably very strange, but it's hard to say, you know, what he deserves blame and credit for, because to be honest, I don't know. And I'm sure as time goes on, we'll find more about it. But one thing I'll always remember about Reggie as the president of Nintendo of America was that willingness to make funny videos and just be goofy and stuff like that. Uh, not too many presidents of a, a company like that would be willing to do that. He was never that good of an actor, but he didn't need to be. You know, that's not where his strength was ne necessary, but it was still always nice to see that from him at all those Nintendo Directs and things like that, and especially when they had more of a sense of humor about it. I, I always enjoyed that. So, obviously, there was a lot more to his job than that, but, you know, he was a cool public face for Nintendo. Uh, the whole My Body is Ready meme and all that stuff is just wonderful. So, Reggie, you will be missed, but now we enter the Doug Bowser era. Now, Beyond his name, we don't really, I personally don't know much about Doug Bowser. Um, obviously, it's its objectively hilarious that uh, the president of Nintendo of America, his last name is Bowser, as everyone knows. That one photo of him circulating around where, you know, he's got, he's saying, like, thank you for welcoming me or whatever it says. And then uh, in the back, you see Mario and Luigi all tied up is, like, hilarious. Um, I just hope that Nintendo truly embraces that. You know, it's not like just, it's it's a coincidence. It has to be a coincidence. There's no way they, you know, they would be foolish enough to, like, pick a guy just based on his last name. But that said, embrace it. You know, you have, you can, you can just make that funny. Go with, like, what Reggie did with videos. Go on the next level with that. Just be like, you know, Bowser, dress him up all weird or something like that. And make, make it look like you're making strange, angry decisions or something. There's, there is a way to embrace the fact that the president of, Amer of Nintendo of America's last name is Bowser. It's just funny. Um, and it's a good thing to just have a sense of humor to engage with your fan base. And I think that that'll be really very neat uh, as long as that goes down uh, like that. But yeah, that's basically all my two cents on the matter. Hopefully, from a, at least from a business perspective, uh, Doug Bowser continues up with solid decisions. And I think he will. I don't... I, I don't... I think the some of the darkest days of Nintendo as far as their community outreach is definitely behind them. You know, their anti-YouTube policies seem to th be a thing of the past. Their anti-Indies policy seems to be a thing of the past. And hopefully, hopefully they just continue up with that type of thing. And I'm, I'm very curious to see what he will do with Nintendo um, at what, being the head of it, which could actually lead into possibly our next subject here. So moving on. Uh, Nintendo Switch and Xbox integration or working together. 
I'm going to keep this incredibly brief because if you watch, depending on when this video comes out to you, uh, I will have done a two-year anniversary of the Nintendo Switch, and I spent like half that video talking about this particular subject. So, in short, I don't want to go over all of that again. But yes, there is a possibility that Nintendo and Microsoft will be working together, uh, and I go into that video in extreme detail and what I personally speculate, keep in mind, speculation, about what that partnership could be or would be. But at the end, it could also just be like, they're just going to allow more cross-compatibility and nothing else is ever going to come of it. We don't know yet, at least at the time I record this. So I'm hoping that under Doug Bowser, uh, you know, they just they get a better relationship with Microsoft and they kind of go in the direction I kind of outlined in my video, which again, I invite you to go watch that instead. But uh, yeah, it, it could be very interesting times over there. I mean, Doug Bowser, again, I don't know the man, but he might be kind of a fresher take to be able to take them into the next, you know, decade, uh, which would be pretty cool. So, oh man, it's weird to think we're getting close to the next decade, isn't it? Wow. But that doesn't matter. Um, so anyway, the, yeah, I know that, that you, we could talk about that for a long time, but I already did. So I recommend you go watch that video instead. So let's move on to our next subject. Uh, this is, I don't really have much to say on this other than just, it's kind of neat. Uh, a lot of you, I'm sure know that Toe Jam and Earl back in the groove, uh, is now out. Uh, for those who are unfamiliar, Toe Jam and Earl was a franchise for the Sega Genesis. It apparently spawned from like a dream that the creator had, uh, and ultimately it would get uh, two Sega Genesis games, and then much later it would get a third game on the original Xbox. There was actually a third game for the Sega Dreamcast, but it was never released. Uh, it would be later leaked onto the internet. Uh, and the game is very different from the original Xbox version. Uh, and then the franchise just kind of went away uh, entirely. I mean, there were a couple of Genesis reissues, you know, digitally and stuff like that. But um, you never really saw the characters again. And Sega didn't, I don't believe Sega owns the characters anymore. I'm not entirely certain how, what the legal ease of that is. But um, there is a new one. And the new one is kind of cool in that uh, it's owns the nostalgia factor it owns the fact that this is like the next in the series and i believe the game was actually fan funded originally uh i remember going to pax west 2018 and uh limited run announced they were going to be doing that game and they actually sold these like cool sega genesis like repros uh of the game it's not actually a playable game it was essentially just a glorified box but it was cool and then they also now have a physical edition for the switch and for the ps4 um, I don't know if there's ever going to be a physical Xbox One version or if there even is a digital Xbox One version. But, um, yeah, the fact is, man, like, it's... I've, I keep noticing this and talking about this more and more, that we are... We truly are the nostalgia generation. Like, we have this weird, unique ability to bring back things that should never have come back uh, or couldn't have come back. I'm not saying they shouldn't have come back. I guess that's a poor way to phrase it. But no one really would have realistically thought Toe Jam and Earl would ever really come back. But... Hey, man, we found a way. Um, and I, I won't even, you know, I'm not going to pretend like that's all, you know, like that's all rosy and stuff. Like, I was never really a fan of the franchise. You know, uh, it was never really my thing, even as a kid. But the fact that there were people that loved it and now there's a new one for them to enjoy is just, I think, awesome. And, yeah, that's that's really a fantastic thing that that kind of uh energy that kind of community can will these things back into existence and uh, you got to celebrate that that's what i'm about that's what i'm celebrating this type of thing so if you were ever a fan of the toe jam and earl franchise maybe go out and check this one out i believe uh, at least at the time i record this you can still get the physical editions of it for our, for the switch and for ps4 i don't know how long that'll last but you know you might want to consider it so that's that Speaking of more nostalgic, blast from the past, modernized, uh, this is fascinating. Um, so usually with anything Dreamcast related, uh, I get hit up about it relatively early. This one, nobody contacted me about. So I was in the dark on this one completely, I fully admit it. But uh, the Retro Fighters, they, they, they make controllers. They did the, the Brawler for the N64. They did an NES version as well. They are doing a Sega Dreamcast version. Um, which is awesome. And they actually went to Kickstarter and they absolutely demolished their goal. Like they smashed it like immediately, uh, showing that there's unbelievable demand for a more modernized controller for the Sega Dreamcast. And I, I agree with that assessment. My position on the Dreamcast controller has always been that it was good for the games it was designed for. It was very much a product of its time. Um, it kind of gets dogged on more now for a couple of reasons. The shape is awkward compared to a lot of other contemporary rivals and more of the modern design that we tend to think of as a gaming 
motion controller. So it's kind of hard for people to go backwards. But if you had it originally, it wasn't really as much of an issue. And the other thing that people always get upset about it with is uh, the fact that it doesn't have two thumbsticks. Now, you can fix the first part by making a controller that's more of that uh, almost, I want to call it the Xbox 360 design. You can, you can have that. The problem is you can't ever have two thumbsticks that really have much of a point. Um, people have this belief, uh, I've noticed it online in comment sections, like they want a second thumbstick because a lot of people think if there's a second thumbstick, then they can manipulate the camera. No, the games weren't made to do that. You can, adding a thumbstick won't magically make games have new updates and features. That's not how that works. Um, so all that you could do by adding a second thumbstick would be to map it to certain pre-existing buttons. Now, in certain cases, that might actually work. Like Soldier of Fortune is a game that actually used, I believe it was the, uh, the A, B, X, and Y buttons to actually act like a second thumbstick, which is horrific. But if you were to make this controller support that, then in that one instance... Uh, that game would actually work really well with that type of controller. But in most instances, that would not be the case. It would just be kind of a thumbstick that did nothing or, or it just replicated buttonality, button functionality. That said, I'm still definitely going to get one of these at some point, do a video on it for sure. Uh, I'd very much like that to check that thing out. So I, congrats to them on all their success there because it seems like it's going to be an awesome controller and ultimately an awesome product. I've got the NES one, and I've really enjoyed it. Uh, I am going to get the N64 Brawler at some point. Uh, but yeah, the Dreamcast one, man, that's pretty cool. And uh, more power to them to, to keep that alive. I respect the hell out of that. So moving on. Next subject up is Sega Fest 2019. Now, at the time I record this, this is like a month away, and the time this comes out, even publicly, it's still not here. So, uh, last year, I actually went to Sega Fest 2018. Uh, Sega brought me out there. That was for Shenmue's announcement and all that stuff. Uh, it was a really great time. This year, I talked to them about it, and at one point, they were pretty sure I was going to go with them, and then that kind of ended up not quite working out because of my schedule and then ultimately different things that they wanted to do. Um, but I'm excited for Sega Fest, but uh, this is so awkward because I can't really talk about it. There are certain things that will happen at Sega Fest that I'm aware of. Um, I hope I get to go to that again in the future. That's always going to be, that was a big, awesome, fun time last year. And, uh, and I wish everybody well, who's going to go out there. If you're in Tokyo area, go out to Sega Fest. It's, it's free to attend. Um, and you just can get a whole bunch of announcements for new Sega games and stuff like that. Uh, Sega's really working hard, man, to fix their image. Like they, you know, I, I told them like, so I walk around in this big blue Sega hoodie that they gave me. Right. And, a lot of the time, man, I'll walk around in that thing and people be like, ah, I remember that. That was like 20 years ago. Like people think Sega doesn't exist anymore. And I'm like, and I'm telling this, these stories. I'm like, you guys have to work on this image, man. Cause this is ridiculous. I'm really tired of walking around people thinking Sega isn't a company anymore. And that I got this hoodie 20 years ago. It's ridiculous. And to an extent they're doing that. They're really trying to improve their image in the video game industry because they got away from it for way too long. Now that said, they're not talk we're not talking about like new consoles. That's ridiculous. Don't go there. But just overall having their name on more games and having more games produced and just kind of continuing to be socially relevant. Uh, and good on them for working hard. So let's move on. Uh, we have now a round of shout outs. Uh, the shout outs are every one of these people are Patreon backers. They are at the uh, tier in which you get a shout out. Uh, and any of them could upgrade their pledge, or you can upgrade your pledge at any time to get shout outs, or, you know, pledge just to get early access to videos, or just to support the channel, which is always appreciated. Or you don't have to do anything. <laughs> it's entirely up to you, though I do appreciate it. Um, so, yeah, shout outs. First up Corey Marsh, Jesse Perez, Joseph Tabarino, Luis Bonilla, Michael Kelly. Eric Perales, Trey Wagner, and Tim Inman. Trey Wagner, by the way, is the guy who I was helping to get all those games for in Toronto. Awesome dude. But anyway, that once again is Corey Marsh, Jesse Perez, Joseph Tabarino, Luis Bonilla, Michael Kelly, Eric Perales, Trey Wagner, and Tim Inman. Thank you all very much for helping to support the channel. You keep all this, you keep in the lights on. Thank you. Much appreciated. Um, so moving on. Uh, this one is just kind of uh, me being sad. Uh <laughs> I have to say goodbye to my Best Buy Gamers Club Unlocked uh, uh, membership. Um, so basically, for those who don't know, uh, Best Buy at one time set up this system uh, called Gamers Club Unlocked. And what you would do is you would sign up for a subscription and you would get 20% off of all of their games uh, right away. And I believe the first 
the first enrollment of it wasn't nearly as good of a deal. It was like $100 for a year. And it wasn't super successful. So later they changed it to $30 for two years of coverage. Now think about that. $30. And you got two years of every single game at Best Buy being 20% off day one. So mathematically speaking, if you picked up a $60 game, automatically it dropped it down to $48. That's 12 bucks off on just one game. So that, if you buy a lot of games, was going to pay off really fast. And I you know, signed up for it, and then I renewed it as soon as I had the chance. But last year, they announced that they were going to stop that program, and it was going to go away. So they were just going to honor the remaining contracts until they were over, and then that's it. You can never sign up for it again. Um, mine has the unfortunate sadness of expiring on March 9th, 2019. So at the time I record this, I still have like another week to enjoy it, but then it's it's gone forever. Um, I do know someone, uh, who has it, who apparently got it like right before they announced that they weren't going to do it anymore. So he'll have it for quite some time. And fortunately you can, you can kind of share that program, but it's not going to be quite as good as having, you know, your own, so you don't have to bother someone else with it. But, uh, yeah, man, I've, I, I'm not, I mean, I'm sad that it's gone, but like I made good use of that thing, man. Like over the course of four years, that's a, that's a lot of money saved. You know, I understand completely why they did it. I mean, they were hemorrhaging cash because when it comes to retail, you don't make money off of new games. You know, you're lucky you make a couple dollars. So they were actually losing money on everything sold. The log- Why would they do that, of course, is the question you have to ask. The logic was, well, if we get someone to come in to, you know, take a nice deal on a, a game, they might come in and also buy, like, a TV or something. Like, they'll come in and buy other stuff was basically the plan. Where they screwed up with it was that, A, they allowed it to work online, so people would only buy specifically what they wanted, and then they would have it shipped to them, so they would never have that, like, well, maybe I'll come in and buy something else type of logic. The other thing they did that was kind of a mistake was assuming that $30 was going to be enough. So there is a certain logic to this when you get people to sign up for these kind of clubs, which is, hey, we'll charge them a fee up front, and then hopefully we just kind of bank on them never really you know, covering that fee, meaning they won't actually collectively save the amount of that fee over the two years. But $30 in two years is easy to do when one game already would save you $12. I mean, that's three games you've already exceeded it. You know what I mean? Um, So that was kind of their logic. Uh, So in a sense, their original version was much more uh, logical for them. You know, the $100 version that only covers you for a year. But yeah, that didn't pan out. Now, maybe if they had introduced it and did something like, you know, what seemed like a, a cheaper deal, but actually wasn't, you know, like you pay $10 a month or something um, instead of paying like a $100 flat rate, which would actually be more money, it'd be $120 for a year. Um, maybe people would have done it, you know, maybe they would have psychologically, it just seems better. And maybe that would have worked. Maybe they'll reintroduce it in some for, um, some form. But when they got rid of it, that's when everything changed. Because then Amazon got rid of their 20% off system because they're like, we have no reason to keep this anymore. And then GameStop actually had the same system in place for used content. And they were hemorrhaging doing that. So they got rid of it. So yeah, those days are behind us, unfortunately, until some other big company steps up to the plate and for some reason would introduce that same uh, system. But I, I can't imagine that anyone will. But uh, it was nice to have you while we have you, uh, Best Buy Gamers Club Unlocked, at least in my case. Some of you who still have yours, enjoy. uh, Enjoy it. Seriously, really do enjoy it because it it will go away and it will never come back. (laughs) But anyway, let's move on. Next up is a short subject just because I haven't had a chance to see it is Captain Marvel. Now, Captain Marvel at the time that I record this is not out yet. Um, and I, I want to see it obviously as part of the whole MCU thing. I, I haven't, I've only been kind of looking at this movie from recent reporting and a lot of people are upset with it. And there's like some sort of SJW battle that's going on with it. I don't, I don't care about any of that stuff. I just care about whether or not the movie's good. And that's all I'm going to talk about here. That's all that matters to me. Um, that being the case, I'm just interested to see it and see where, not only what it does with the MCU timeline, which it'll take place before most of the events of the MCU timeline, but uh, what kind of lasting effects and characters and stories and things it will have and how it will tie into the next Avengers film. But to me, it's kind of the stepping stone film between, well, I guess Ant-Man and the Wasp already kind of was that. It's the next stepping stone film between Avengers movies. So, yeah, very much looking forward to it just to get that next episode of a TV show, basically. It's a weird way to look at Marvel movies, man. Like, you can watch them two ways. And I've had this discussion, I think it was actually with Scott the Canadian before, because he's not a big fan of the Marvel stuff. 
And I told him, like, you know, he's like, some of them, you know, you just sit there and watch and, like, they don't make any sense and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, are you watching it like it's a TV show or are you watching it like a movie? He's like, well, I'm watching it like a movie because it's a movie. And I'm like, there's a valid point to that, yes. But at the same time, they're they're kind of designed to have you watch everything in one go and everything in sequence. Like, they can, to an extent, function like standalone movies, but they're massively enhanced when you watch them like they're not. Uh, and so that being the case, I always treat them more like they're just one or two episodes of a TV show you get every year. Uh, and then I find that you have much more enjoyment in that. But that's me personally, and I, I, I kind of invite everybody to go try it the same way, but that's entirely up to you. But for now, since I haven't seen Captain Marvel, that's that's all I can say, but I will be seeing it soon. Next up, X-Men Dark Phoenix and uh, the New Mutants. So I, I thought this was kind of done, but apparently not. Um a little backstory here. Fox, their film division, has been absorbed by Disney. Fox was the guys producing X Men movies really since 1999 because they had a they, they had the license to those characters. They no longer will. Uh, Disney will get that back now that they own Fox. The problem is that they started production of two different X Men movies while that was happening. And, and in the end, we have two extras that Disney doesn't really want, like X-Men Dark Phoenix is one of them, and the other one is uh, the, something called The New Mutants. These movies would not be canon with anything that is Disney's Marvel stuff, uh, and also it's not necessarily going to be canon with the original Fox Marvel stuff because uh, that, that era is over. Uh, in fact, Dark Phoenix, the one that's coming, was supposed to be the first of a trilogy, and I guess there's no chance in hell that it gets a trilogy. So the question is, uh, it has people have been proposing since the merger was even first announced, is what does Disney do with these? Um, you know, that was a lot of money spent. There's a lot of big names involved. There's some recouping efforts you could put in. But at the same time, the argument for never releasing them is that they just kind of muddy the waters of what Disney wants to do. It's been enough time now since the last Fox X-Men movie that, you know, we can start to forget that franchise. And I don't, I don't mean that in a negative way. I just mean like Disney wants to use that, those characters and they want to have their own versions of them that aren't tainted by, you know, 20 plus years of continuity and all that stuff that Fox put together. So they want to have fresh versions they can throw eventually into the MCU. If you release one of the, these two older X-Men movies and just muddy the waters, you just it's going to take even more time, multiple years, before you can revisit them fresh. Uh, because people are like, well, that X-Men movie just came out. Do I have to do this again? You know what I mean? Like, it's just weird. Um, so it sounds like... Uh, what they're actually going to do is still release it theatrically, at least Dark Phoenix. I don't know about New Mutants yet. I mean, New Mutants was actually supposed to come out over, I think it was almost a year ago, which is ridiculous. Um, but they supposedly, the official reasoning behind them is they both needed like reshoots and a lot of work and blah, blah, blah. Unofficially, it's probable that Disney requested that they don't release them for that exact reason. But it sounds like now they are actually going to release Dark Phoenix in some form. It was popularly believed that they might do some sort of thing where they just kind of cut their losses and only release it on, like, Hulu or Disney Plus or something like that rather than put it out too far and maybe just try to recoup some of the funds and just call it a day. Um, but it sounds like they're at least at least Dark Phoenix is still getting a theatrical run. Again, we don't know about New Mutants. But what do you guys think will happen? I find it just strange like it seems unfortunate like i want them out so that people can see them but at the same time i i kind of agree with the logic of like don't muddy the waters you know if you want to do this clean slate of new x-men stuff you have these like lingering ghosts from the previous era that you have to deal with which is kind of unfortunate but yeah moving on we got a couple of uh star wars related things uh star wars jedi fallen order by respawn apparently is going to be shown off at star wars celebration here in chicago which is it's highly probable I'm actually going to be at that, so it'll be kind of cool to check that out along with other Star Wars related things. Um, I, I do vaguely remember a trailer for this or an announcement or something. Honestly, I don't really remember much about it. Uh, I went to Star Wars Celebration once a few years ago in London. It was pretty cool. It wasn't the kind of thing you go to for video game news. It's really obviously for Star Wars news specifically. Um, but yeah, in general, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing more information about this game as well as any other Star Wars content, though. I'm, I'm still of the philosophy that I still wish that Disney would take the franchise away from EA. I just, I really don't like it being in their hands because it's just, it has not worked out at all. 
Um, personally, I would want to give it over to Ubisoft, but you know, see who else you can you can talk to about that. To be honest with you, but who knows? Maybe Fall in Order will somehow save the entire thing. But with EA's name on it, I, I never believe in the possibility of good coming from it. And I, so, so I'll just leave it at that. Um, and speaking of Star Wars. Uh, we might also find out more about this at Star Wars Celebration. There's a lot of talk about different uh, series and you know possible movies, but right now it seems to be all about uh, miniseries and TV shows and things like that. Not so much movies, like theatrical releases. Uh, but this one in particular I found interesting. Uh, the Star Wars Obi-Wan miniseries might be a thing for Disney+. Plus. Um, if rumors are to be believed, rather than making a standalone Obi-Wan Kenobi movie, uh, they would make a six-episode miniseries about you know Ewan McGregor's version of Obi-Wan Kenobi and what he's going through after Revenge of the Sith, but before A New Hope. Uh, I personally would be totally for this. It would be kind of interesting to see. Do you remember the John Adams series with uh, Paul Giamatti? I think it would be great to do a Star Wars series like that, but with Obi-Wan, where it's just, you know, it's a few episodes, but it shows a whole bunch of stuff, and it just goes over a massive course of time, and just, and you just see him, you know, getting older, and all that kind of stuff, and just the drama behind it, because while John Adams was a real person and everything, and his story was insane, um, Obi-Wan's is obviously fictional, and you can write whatever you want, but you have to think, even with what we understand, he had a very complicated situation i mean he you know essentially is part of the reason that the galaxy fell apart in the sense it's it's on him uh for i'm not gonna say for being a bad mentor but for not being a good enough mentor uh and i'm sure he feels the weight of that the guilt of that uh everything he knew collapsed around him because he just maybe he just wasn't good enough at being a teacher you know what i'm saying and it, there's a lot to that knowing that his friends betrayed him and all his you know everybody he cared about is dead or whatever and life's all screwed um meanwhile he has to look out and protect the offspring of the man who did all this you know it, it just it's a lot um and i think that there's some good drama in there that could tell that could be some very good storytelling i just don't want it to be something stupid where it's like every episode he has to like fight some big monster or something dumb like you know just Make it more interpersonal. Make it more of a character study uh, rather than just, you know, cartoon villain of the week type of storylines. I don't want that. But we'll see. And, you know, I think about that as opposed to a theatrical movie. And I actually think I like this better. I think I like the idea of them spacing it out and telling a more in-depth story. Now, maybe I'm just imagining this story more than they're actually going to give it. Maybe they will just give me a cartoon of the week type of thing. But, um I'd rather have it be something, like I said, like the John Adams thing and see if you can do that with Obi-Wan. That would be really, really cool. The only downside to this, in my opinion, so far, is that it's apparently would be exclusively made for Disney+. Plus. Now, I don't think I intend to subscribe to Disney+. Plus. Uh, I would either wait for a Blu-ray release uh, or possibly watch it somewhere else. I don't really want to sign up for yet another digital streaming service, but I have to admit Disney plus is probably the most tempting one that isn't Netflix, but we'll, we'll see down the road. doesn't matter right now. Um, so that's that. Now, the last thing I'm going to talk about is not really news, but I just want to mention to you guys, like, uh, depending on when you've watched this, I'm either about to have, or have had a crazy ass month. Um, you know, I will be out in Los Angeles for a few days then I'll be out in San Francisco for like a week. Then it sounds like I might be up in Toronto for a couple of days, then off to New York. And it's just like, oh, it's chaos. But at the same time, I just want to let you guys know, like, I've got some video content produced for you. You're not going to go starving on that stuff. I'll try to make more whenever I get the chance. Um, just been extremely busy lately, but I appreciate you guys so much. Thank you so much for watching and listening and possibly even being Patreon backers. It means a lot to me. Um, you guys are the best. You guys are awesome. So that's it. Thank you very much to all of you. Also, again, special shout outs to Corey Marsh, Jesse Perez, Joseph Tamburino, Luis Bonilla, Michael Kelly, Eric Perales, Trey Wagner, Tim Inman. You guys are superstars. You're all heroes to me. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you all later.